Father, we stand in your presence by means of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit, thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to feast upon your word. Father, we are keenly aware of how little we know and how infinite is your word. May the Holy Spirit take charge of this time, stripping away foolishness and ignorance, but opening our hearts to truth. Keep us from dealing deceitfully with your word or going beyond what is written, that Jesus Christ might be glorified, for it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying Colossians verse by verse, but I was asked to address John 3.16. Probably the most familiar verse in the Bible and also probably one of the least studied. Now, as usual, I ask no one to believe what is said here. If you belong to the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have the ability to search the scriptures daily to see whether what is said here is true. What I want to establish first off is that God has a family. Every Christian seems to realize that God has a family. However, most Christians today believe that that family is composed of those who decided that they would like to have God as their father, and that's where the problem comes in, and that there are those who decided against that, when in fact there is a definite line of scriptural truth that God has a family that he's ordained before time began. And I've heard it said, well, Steve, uh, okay, I can, I can, I can get along with the idea that God chose me, but I believe what he done was he, he looked down in history and he saw that I was going to choose him. And so based upon my choice of him, he chose me. And I'll just tell you straight out, that is uh, not a valid argument. Our choosing God invalidates divine election. I don't know how to put it any simpler than that. Folks, if, if God's election is based upon your electing him, then there's no purpose, no reason whatsoever for election in the first place. In other words, election doesn't mean anything. It can't be both. Man wants it to be both. It's not. The truth is, is that God has a family that he's ordained before time began. And there is plenty of, of scriptural proof on that if you care to seek that out. I'm going to read you a few verses here before we begin. Uh, Psalm 47, 4. He shall choose our inheritance for us. The excellency of Jacob whom he loved, Selah. Psalm 65, 4. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Isaiah 26, 12. Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hast wrought all our works in us. Isaiah 53, 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 4, 16. Therefore, it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. Romans 5, 8. But God commended, commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Freely given. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. 
but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now that's eight verses, and there are probably hundreds. Clearly, clearly, God wants us to realize that we are in his plan, his purpose, his love, his family, not because of anything that we did, but because he is our heavenly father and we are his children, that he begat us. I've spent a lot of time on this channel proclaiming the scriptural truth that we did not become members of God's family because we decided that we were going to be. And so now let's look at John 3.16 just a bit because it cannot, John 3.16, as famous as that verse is, it cannot contradict the rest of scripture. It has to fit into the whole. For God so loved the world, and it's clear that he didn't love Esau. He says, Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And you can say, well, Steve, okay, he loved both of them. He just didn't love Esau as much as Jacob. But that's not the word that he uses. And the only reason that I can come up with that anyone would push that narrative, that would push it that way, is to suggest that God loves, and here we go, it's ought, to, it's ought to run just about, you know, the rest of you off, so I don't have to do this anymore. That God loves everybody. But not one verse of scripture says that he loves everybody. Not one. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. And when you use the word all, even in, in ordinary language, the, the word whosoever there in the original text is all, pas. When you use the word all, even in, in ordinary language, it is always modified by the context, folks. We're either going to win all the games or we're going to lose all the games, but that doesn't mean every game that is played. Only the games that our team is playing. You know, we're going to see all the people. Well, that doesn't mean everybody who's dead, just the living ones who happen to be coming to that meeting or, or that event. Or, or when I say all the people, I may be referring to all the people in my town, not all the people in the world. It's always limited by the context. It's modified by the context. You do that every day. You use the word all in the context of, of a limited, well, just a limited context. You're certainly not using the word all in a broad meaning to, to mean all, just everything. And that is the word in the original text. It's translated whosoever. But that's an English translation. And for you King James only people out there, the King James Version is a translation just like all the rest. The Holy Spirit did not write the New Testament in King James. He wrote it in Koine Greek. It's a dead language. It was the common everyday language of the time. And we have multiple, numerous. In fact, I believe now we've got over 500 English translations alone. For God, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him. So, that doesn't mean everybody. And we have to do something with the word world. That, that word world doesn't mean everybody, folks. If you teach a Bible class... Okay, and you say, you know, can you find a verse of scripture that said that says God loves everybody? Well, invariably, John three sixteen here comes up. You know, everybody knows that cosmos there means everybody, and when you point out that you know, well, wait a minute, my name's Esau. Well, then there's this steel hush on the class. 
You know, because now somebody's going to teach this horrible, devilish doctrine of election and predestination, which, of course, the Holy Spirit revealed. God ordained a world system, and God so loved that which he ordained. When he sowed the seed, they came to him. I pointed this out in the previous video, Matthew 13. And they said, you sowed bad seed, to which our Lord said, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Now, I don't know what you do with that scripture, but that's what our Lord Jesus said. I didn't do it. An enemy did this. And if you were to ask me, how does Satan sow seed? Folks, I have no idea. Okay. And I'm not going to try to make something up. I don't have any idea how you did that. I don't know. What I do know is that in that parable, the Lord Jesus Christ himself taught in Matthew 13, I didn't sow that, Satan did. And now I don't have to, I don't have to look very far for that tear, okay, in the Bible. I don't have to go very far in Scripture to see Cain, First kid ever born. First kid that was ever born, God's word says, was the son of the devil. And there, there ain't very many people in the Bible where God comes right out and openly says they are sons of the devil, but he does with Cain. And he slew his brother. So I don't have to look very far to find terror. I don't know how Satan did that. What I do know is he did it. And what I do know is that God tells me that the field is the world in which he sowed good seed. Therefore, based upon what is written, I have to conclude that God loved that system in which he sowed good seed. And he's going to purge out the tear where that when that tear is gathered, it's gathered to be burned. And the word loved there in the text is an aorist indicative. He really did it. Indicative mood. The mood of reality, of certainty. Aorist tense. And no time, for you people that are any, any bit familiar with the Greek, you know that there's no, no time ought to be tied to that tense. It's simply an action that occurred. It is not going to be repeated in that Christ died unto sin once. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. Hebrews 9.28 Reminds me of a video I did several years back on aliens, extraterrestrials. You know, E.T. If there are sinners on other planets, which they would, they would have to be sinners if there were, it's difficult for me to believe that God became incarnate on other planets and died unto sin twice or, or as many times as there are aliens on other worlds. He only did it once. That's an aorist. Okay? His only begotten son. And only begotten doesn't mean the only one born. I'm a son of God. Folks, that is a term of endearment. Abraham sacrificed his only begotten son, Isaac, but actually he had several other kids. The Holy Spirit uses the term only begotten. It's a term of endearment. That is all it is. And we have the word whosoever and an entire false gospel narrative, a false belief system has been built on that one word, whosoever. And that's an English word. The Greek word is pos, pi alpha sigma. It means all. You might as well put all there. Whosoever is the translation of the original Greek word pos, which means all. And it sounds... You know, the, the whosoever, it sounds exactly like what man wants you to believe. That the ball is in your court, that God Almighty says, I've done all I can do, the ball's in your court, and if the ball's in my court, folks, I am in one, I'll just go ahead and say it, I'm in one hell of a mess, pun intended. Okay? The problem, folks, with that is that it flies in the, in, the, in the face of a tremendous body of Scripture. I mean, I, I read just a few verses. I, I should have, uh, 
I should have added, no man can come unto me except my Father, which is in heaven, forces him, forces him. The word force being a word which the world religious system doesn't want to, doesn't, they don't like that word very much. They don't want to hear that because, you know, we got to sell Bibles to everybody. When the early translation is draw, but when draw was used 400 years ago, it meant force. Folks, the tractor didn't sit there with, with the draw bar and say, now plow, please come with me. You know, I'd like you to turn the earth over. It was drawn. It was forced through the earth. Water was drawn out of the well. Nobody stood at the top of the well and said, water, please come up here and get in this bucket. And we've allowed the language to change. And suddenly the word draw in John 6, is now invite. That's not the word. Paul was forcibly dragged into the court in Acts. That's the word, same word. Same word. No man can come unto me except my father drags him. When we were sinners, Christ died for us. When we weren't working for God, he died for us, folks. When we weren't doing righteousness, he died for us. When we were his enemy, he died for us. Romans chapter 3. So he gave his only begotten son that all who are believing in him, this is a present participle. Now, for those of you who are, you know, Greek experts, which I'm not, I want to be very careful. You know, anybody out there, any one of you could raise your hand and say, you know, look, you can't really build serious doctrine on participles. And my answer to that is, I don't, I don't know that I want to build serious doctrine on any particular part of speech. But it's interesting to me that the Lord Jesus Christ taught marvelous spiritual truth, deeply profound spiritual truth, based on a singular or a plural or a present or a past tense in, in other parts of, of, of grammar construction. In John 8, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. Tremendous theology is built there on the grammar. He did not say seeds as of many, but as of one to thy seed, which is Christ. And if you really want to look into the truth of that scripture, all of the basis of your relationship to God, the beauty of the finished work of Christ, Okay, the fact that your life is hidden with Christ in God is based, folks, it's based in that singular. If you are Abraham's seed and you belong to Christ Jesus, and that singular includes all of us, it's basically the Lord Jesus Christ, but all of us who've been placed in Christ deep theology is seen built on a singular or the plural of a noun it's a present participle but i'm also convinced god has so designed his word he's so constructed this book that a child can understand it even in the english folks the word is loved l-o-v-e-d for god so loved not for god so loves so if we were to translate it fairly, we would say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that all who are believing in him or all of the believing should not perish, but have everlasting life. And it would be very difficult based on the grammar to suggest that the verse is saying, it's your choice, your option, or that this is an invitation, that the ball is in your court, when in fact, it is simply stating a fact. It's the verse, folks, is stating a marvelous fact, a marvelous declaration of God's grace. John 3.16, which is unarguably the most sacred verse in, in, in Christendom. It is the, it's, and I, and I know I, for many of you, I, it seems like, you know, Steve, gosh, man, you're slaughtering a sacred cow here. Yeah, and it's the Black Angus, folks. It's, yeah. I'm sorry about that, but I have to deal honestly with the text. 
so that all pass, all the believing, is what it says. When we should know that only his sheep can and will believe. Okay? Folks, I'm not twisting anything. I'm making it fit the rest of Scripture. And that's what we have to do. No matter what turmoil or trouble comes about as a result of that. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. It's, it's a dear, precious verse that, you know, that there's hardly a Christian that doesn't know that verse by heart. But folks, have you really studied the verse and looked at it in light of all the rest of Scripture? Now, folks, it is not an invitation to goats to become sheep. It is a matter-of-fact statement concerning what God in Christ has done for his people. Okay? Pos means all. All the believing. The grammar also states that God loved the world once, aorist tense. He loved it fully and completely. He couldn't have loved it any more than what he did. And is no longer loving the world. He's no longer loving the world. Even the English says loved. Not loves, but loved. Aorist tense. Love not the world. The... Folks, we are told to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Okay, we would not be commanded to not love something that God himself is still loving. And part of the trouble that Christians have today in our agreeing on what this book is saying is that in many cases we speak a totally different language. And my Bible says that I should shun that. I see Christian after Christian getting into those debates, and I think back in my early years in Bible college where I'd hear the professor say, you know, if you really study Christian apologetics, you can argue any soul into heaven. And I'd, I'd say to myself, wow, I guess, you know, we don't, we don't need the Holy Spirit then. You know, we only need four credit hours at this school. Folks, this book teaches you that we were God's children before the foundation of the world. God's choice is not based upon human volition. It's not based upon anything we did. It's not like the world, folks, okay? It's not like OU football, okay, where we want, we want six-foot, 280-pound guys who can run 300 yards in 10 seconds, you know, if we can just find the guy. You know, that's the way we choose, Therefore, you know, we carry that over into the spiritual sphere, the realm of everything, and we think, that, well, that's the way God chooses, and that is not true, folks. He planted us. God has given us so many illustrations to drive this same point home. He planted us. Every plant which my Father has not planted shall be rooted up. The inference clearly is that we were planted by him, but there's a further interest in that there are plants he did not plant, which is exactly what he said in Matthew 13. But if he planted it, it will not be rooted up in what God planted he calls believers. And when we get to heaven, dearly beloved, not a single one of us will say that we got there by keeping the law, by doing good works, or anything else. Not because of any decision that we made, not because we decided that we were born, going to born again ourselves, that we were going to somehow pull off by, by this. You know, it's always amazed me that, that any Christian could possibly think that this supernatural event, something that is, that I guess it's almost akin to God saying, let there be light, occurred at the moment that we made a decision to do something and so we became born again. We became born by God from above. Or God so designed it in such a way as to where that he timed that decision that we made with his begatting us, being born from above. Folks, that is not how it works. 
the only reason that you believe is because you were born again. You didn't believe to be born again. You didn't do anything. Your, your belief did not bring about your new birth. You were only able to believe because you were born by God from above. When that was, I don't know. I can't even tell you when that was in my own life. All I know is that when I made a decision for Christ, when I believed and exercised faith in Christ, it was because I was his, because he infused life into me first, okay? And everything else followed. It begins with life, folks. It starts with life. And modern Christianity today is... is has just completely abandoned the first few chapters of Romans that we, we studied concerning total depravity. We were spiritually dead. We had no ability whatsoever to do anything to remedy our lost condition. God had to bring us and quicken us to life first. And then everything else has followed, and modern Christianity has put the cart before the horse. They've done that with this verse as well as the, as the rest of Scripture. This is no different than anything else. They've taken John 3.16 3, and they put the cart before the horse. And I'm confident enough to tell you that I want you to stop and think for a moment just how uh, dangerous uh, you know, it would be for me to suggest what I'm suggesting about such a sacred verse of, 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 of Christendom, how dangerous it would be if I was if I was wrong, if I was incorrect. Folks, I'm, I'm not incorrect about this. The reason I'm not incorrect is because I'm just showing you what the text teaches. And I'm telling you that we have to take John 3.16 and interpret it in the in the in, in view of, in light of, all of the rest of Scripture. It has to harmonize with the rest. It can't stand alone and contradict all the rest. Folks, it can't. It just can't do that. The fact that seems to slip most Christians' notice is that you believe because you are a believer. There is no way you could believe anything if you were not a believer. Where did we ever get the idea that we become a believer by believing? You believe because you're a believer, okay? That's just as true of every other experience in your life. The first time you ever took that kid's lunch money in the third grade is because you're a thief, okay? You wouldn't have taken it if you hadn't been. Your taking it did not make you a thief, Okay, Folks, these are all who are believing in him who should not perish, and that's an heiress, but have everlasting life, life eternal. That's why he came. That's why God Almighty became incarnate in human flesh, that we as his children, who were sinners dead in sin, might have eternal life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. And once again... We have our word saved, sozo. It's a passive voice, an aorist passive. It's something God did, not something God's doing. We spent a lot of time on this channel studying about what Christ came to do. There's a whole series of scripture on what Christ came to do. And the question that every Christian has to face is, did he do it? I'm persuaded by what I hear on radio and te on TV and other media outlets that so-called Christian, that most Christians believe that he did not do it, but that he left it up to us to finish it. When it says he came to seek and to save the lost, you know, he started it, but he never finished it. Yet he said on the cross, it is finished. He came to deliver his people from their sin. Did he do it? He absolutely did. And I want you to note that the world that he's not judging is most interesting because there is a world system that he does judge. 
Therefore, this is a world system that he doesn't judge, and so that adds to the evidence. It adds to the evidence that the system we're talking about here is the God-ordained system, which includes not only those who are children of Abraham, but of the Gentiles whom he shall call. That system is delivered. Delivered from what? Well, if you look at the word saved, and if you simply follow sozo through the scriptures, it's a far cry from eternal life. There's eternal life in verse 16, which would indicate the system there is dealing with God's elect. In verse 17, the system is delivered, sozo, and it's possible to use that word of the system rather than of individuals, because it needs to be delivered from the bondage of Satan. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And you folks, you can argue without end. Why did he have to buy it since it was already his? You know, he's created, he's spoken into existence. I have no idea. I mean, I can guess at that, but, but guesses don't get us very far, folks. Apparently, God put Lucifer in charge of that system that he created, and he said, he, you know, Luke, he said, I will arise and ascend. I'll be like the Most High. You know, where's he going to arise from? I, I can only conclude the earth. Apparently, when God created the heavens and the earth, he put Satan in charge of the earth, you know, signed some kind of, you know, contract with him. I don't know. But, but I am told in the word of God that he had to redeem it. He had to buy it back. And he gives me that illustration over and over again. In the Old Testament, it needs to be redeemed. It needs to be purchased. And God did that. He did that. Nobody in the Old Testament could purchase themselves. Nobody could redeem themselves. God is pointing out that redemption is in the Redeemer, and you can't redeem yourself. The purpose of the incarnation was not to judge the system that he had created, but to deliver it. The Holy Spirit pins in Isaiah. Oh Lord, why do you cause us to err from our ways? And I got to ask you, what you know, wh folks? What do you suppose that means? So that God could display His grace, mercy, and love toward us through the sacrifice of His only begotten Son. The reason they erred is because God caused it. Did He have a purpose in that? Absolutely. I do not believe that the God of all creation, the monarch of eternity, does anything without a purpose and a, des a design. And I believe without question that purpose, that purpose is because it is best for you. That redemption is solely the work of God is because it is best for us. It's best for us, folks. Because if it was not, we would be condemned with the rest of unbelieving mankind. We could not choose to follow Christ because we were spiritually dead. We had to be made alive first. We believe because we are His. No one ever, ever, ever became a member of God's family because they did something. And yet that is the message that modern Christianity proclaims today. Why? Why? Because we were physically born into that system and in, in most cases nurtured and brought up in it. You know, there's a strange comfort in numbers, even if it happens to be a lie. And folks, listen, I don't know of, of too many preachers, Bible teachers on the web that are telling you this. Do you think that I want to, to put myself off? You know, I, I want to isolate myself and make myself appear to be, you know, the greatest heretic that ever lived in the 21st century. Folks, I can't help but teach the truth of this book. I refuse to do anything but deal honestly with this text. If I can't do that, I need to quit. 
for those of you who've had any Greek at all, you know that it, in a in a purpose clause, a Heine clause, it's requ- it's actually required in the Greek that the subjunctive mood be used, the mood of uncertainty. And since this is a subjunctive mood, it's translated might, okay, and properly so. I mean, that is that's a rule of grammar, not an option of human volition. You know, in the English language, if you express a condition contrary to fact, then you ought to use the first person plural. If, you know, if, if I say I'm going to go out into the pasture, but, you know, I'm not, you know, even though it's a singular noun, it's a plural, and that's required in the English language. If the condition is is uh, not contrary to fact, if I if I said I was going to if I was going out into the pasture and I really am going, then I can use the first person singular. But if I'm not going, I'm supposed to use the first person plural, and and that does not sound right in the Greek language. If it's a purpose clause, it is. The grammar requires that the subjunctive mood be used. The subjunctive mood does not necessarily imply volition. You know, that you, you, you know, that your will, okay, in the matter. But that's what it looks like in the King James. Now, that's a little more technical, but I don't know how to explain it other than that. The subjunctive mood does look like it becomes a part of human volition. I'll, I'll admit that. But the way, in the way... You know, the way that you would answer that is to look at other scriptures. Blessed is the man whom thou chooses and causes to come unto me. I mean, that's not human volition. You've got to make that verse fit this verse, and you've got to make all of the other verses that that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, that, that it's God who works in us, both the will and the do of his good pleasure, that no man can come unto the Father except he is forced to come, all of these verses have to fit this one, folks. And it would be wrong to make the subjunctive here say that this is an act of human volition and and that it's, well then, so it's up, now it's up to you. It's really up to you. The ball's in your court. That's modern evangelism. And that is not biblical. Just a word about the uh, word eternal. Almost everybody I talk to thinks eternity will, well, I just mean lots of years. You know, H.G. Wells, who was a, a very brilliant man, you know, wrote in his book, History of the World, that there's, a, you know, he tried to illustrate that. You know, there's a rock, you know, that's one mile high, it's one mile wide, it's one mile thick. And and once every 10,000 years, you know, a hummingbird goes up there to sharpen its beak. And when the hummingbird's beak has worn the whole rock away, well, then the first day of eternity will have elapsed. But, you know, poor old H.G. Wells was just as dumb as, you know, the rest of us, you know, who who think that eternity equals uh, lots of time. It isn't. Eternity has nothing to do with time. Eternity is not an extension of time. You know, and the Greeks had the same problem that we do. And the word eternal here is ages upon ages to the ages of the ages. I mean, that sounds like time piled on top of time. You know, it's 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 what we do. It's what we do because the human mind can't comprehend timelessness. You know, one of the aspects of the curse is that we're bound by time. And the amazing thing about time is that it's not constant. And, and now we're getting into the realm of physics, but this, the so-called speed of light, you know, we now think that maybe, they, well, that, maybe that's not constant, you know, because uh, some experiments uh, proved, you know, that time is not constant. We think time is constant, but we know it isn't. We think the speed of light is constant. You know, we hope it is because a lot of our physics is 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 based on it. So it isn't time piled on top of time. I believe the expression, the everlasting life here, means quality of life. Zoe, you know, the word, it's it expresses more of a quality of life rather than quantity of life. 
though Scripture makes it clear that it, it is forever without end. I believe the life that he's talking about is Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by means of me, and the eternal life is a life in him. It's a life that has no end, and yet 90% of Christendom, and I don't think that's an exaggeration, believes that it can end. You know, well, I had eternal life for, you know, a couple of weeks till I got, you know, slipped up and wound up back in the bar again, and, you know, and with all my friends, my old, old friends, and, you know, I sinned, and so I lost eternal life, and well, now I need it again, or at least that's what they're saying, you know, I need it again. I think what the scriptures are saying is that in Christ, you're never out of Christ. You never were. There was an aspect where he called you dead out of fellowship. This, my son, was dead. He wasn't physically dead. And is alive again. He, he was always a son. He was always the son. That is eternal life. Look, I hope I've helped somewhat uh, some people with this. Uh, I run the tremendous risk of putting myself out of work here. I told Sue, I said, I'll, I'm just going with the flow, okay? You know, I can't compromise my the, the, my the integrity of this ministry, the honesty and the truthfulness of this ministry. I can't compromise that in any way for the sake of, of views or subscribers or anything else. Look, I love you all. I truly do. I know it's tough, but Lord bless every one of you. I appreciate your your prayers, your continued ongoing prayers. We need your prayers more than ever. We also need your support. Uh, if you feel led to donate to this ministry, you can do that by going to blessedhopeforever.com. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.